September 20, 2001. George W. Bush, President of the United States, addresses the joint session of Congress with these words. Whether we bring our enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. And we all know what he meant by those words, don't we? That we're gonna hunt down and we're gonna kill the people responsible for this heinous crime. Do you think the president's words reflect God's attitude towards wayward humanity? God's justice. Does the justice of a vengeful nation accurately represent the justice of God? Is it right to conclude God runs his universe like sinful beings run earthly governments? Or do we misrepresent God and obstruct his healing love when we construe God's justice to be like our own? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Is there a reason that the Bible uses ferocious beasts to represent earthly governments, but a lamb represents Jesus? could it suggest something different about how the two systems operate? Could human justice and God's justice be distinctly different? Isaiah 55, seven through nine, the Bible says, let the wicked forsake his ways and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God and he will freely, freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts, your thoughts. Is God making the point that his justice is not like human justice? Does God freely pardon, whereas humans seek revenge but call it justice? So what is justice? Doing what is right, which is defined by what? In boxing, it's just to punch someone in the face. In soccer, it's unjust to punch someone in the face. In Germany, it's just to drive 160 miles an hour on the Autobahn. In fact, I've done that recently. I wasn't driving, I was riding. In the United States, it is not just to drive 160 miles an hour on the interstate. Justice is determined by the law of that organization. That's what determines what's right. So how do you see God's law? As designer or dictator? Designer. His law, the protocols upon which life is built, is constructed, the laws of health, the laws of physics, the laws of thermodynamics, the law of love, as we described in the last presentation about how God constructed life to operate upon this principle of of giving or beneficence. Or do you see it like the dictator, rules imposed with no inherent consequences to control our behavior? How do you see his law? The Bible defines God's law as the law of love. If you faithfully keep the commands I'm giving you today, the Lord your God, to serve him and love him with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, you'll have all these benefits. Or love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is fulfillment of the law. Or the entire law summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. Or if you keep the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Or as Jesus said, all law hangs upon love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. God, as designer, built his universe to operate in harmony with the nature, his nature of love. And we talked about this in the last presentation, that that the Bible teaches that God's divine nature is seen as what he has made so that men are without excuse. And we gave the example, uh, every breath you take, and I want you to think about this for a minute and notice how justice works in this model. You are free to deviate from the design and tie a plastic bag over your head and selfishly hoard your carbon dioxide to yourself. You are now a transgressor of the law. You're transgressing. And, when, and the wages of transgressing the law, according to scripture, is death. Do you see how simple and straightforward this is? When you deviate from God's design, it is incompatible with life. Christianity, Jesus gave 
to heal. He surrendered himself in love to save. We see the principle of love in the entire life of Jesus lived out. Greater love is no man that he give his life for a friend. This is how we know what love is, that Christ gave his life for us and we ought to give our lives for our brothers. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but the one who loses his life or gives his life for my sake will find it. In the early church, the apostolic church practiced the law of love, gave to support one another, and refused to go to war with Rome, but they gave their lives as martyrs. We see that this is how the church was founded. But something changed within Christianity. What changed? How they understood God's law and their how for, therefore how they understood God. Daniel prophesied in Daniel 7.25 that a power would arise to seek to change God's law. How did the idea, because you really can't change his law, you can only change the idea and how we think of his law. How did the idea of God's law change? Constantine converted. And when Constantine converted, Christianity accepted Imperial Rome's idea of law. No longer the law of love, no longer the design protocols upon which life is constructed to operate, but instead, God's law is like a Roman emperor, dictated rules put upon his creation to control behavior and test obedience. This is out of uh, Lightheart's book, Defending Constantine. Constantine's rhetoric against both pagans and Jews was forceful, sometimes vicious. And this, along with the legal restrictions, created an atmosphere that discouraged but did not destroy paganism. He Christianized public spaces in Rome, founded and restored sacred sites in Palestine, and founded Constantinople. When disputes arose in the church, Constantine believed it was his right and duty as Roman emperor to guide the warring factions to resolution. Once the bishops had arrived at a decision, Constantine accepted it as the divine word and backed up conciliar decisions with legal sanctions, mainly exile for those. Do you notice what law is being used here? The government is coming in and passing laws now to enforce religious belief systems. But where's the Bible principle, Romans 14, 5? Let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. Where is the Bible principle, leaving people free to decide for themselves? If he was following the dictates of the bishops, as is suggested here, why weren't the bishops telling him, hey, Constantine, no, no, no. God doesn't practice methods like that. He presents truth and love and leaves people free. Why were they going along as the church with this idea of legal sanction? What type of law is being used in an imposed arbitrary law system? Or Eusebius, the first church historian from 263 to 339 CE. Notice this. There is no reserves in the stilted praise with which Eusebius closes his history. No wistful regret for the blessings of persecution. No prophetic fear of imperial uh, control of the church. His heart is full of gratitude to God and Constantine. And it is not only his feelings that are stirred, he is ready with a theory, indeed a theology of the Christian emperor. He finds the correspondence between religion and politics with the Roman Empire monarchy had come on earth as the image of the monarchy in heaven. First church historian. Do you see this idea that God's government is accurately represented by a Roman dictator? God's law is no longer understood as the law of love, the law of life, the protocol upon which God created the universe. The real change to God's law is imperialism, that God's law is imposed like an imperial Roman dictator imposes law, put upon his creatures to govern their behavior and test their obedience. God may be called creator, but he's represented as dictator. Evidence for this change. I don't want to just claim this happened. I want to show you the evidence for it. What church committee ever voted to change the law of gravity or law of respiration? Why not? And you know the answer, because they can't, right? So then what would it mean, by definition, if a church did vote to change God's law? Wouldn't it mean that they don't see God's law as the design protocols upon life, but they see it simply as a list of rules with no inherent consequences that are subject to change like all arbitrary and imposed laws are? And in fact, Catholic Encyclopedia, volume four, the church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, seventh day of the week to the first day, made the third commandment refer to Sunday, the day of, this isn't about Saturday or Sunday. This is about, how do you see God's law? 
Can a church, can a committee vote to change God's law? And if they do, do you understand the bigger change is not which day of worship, it's the whole construct of how you conceive of law. It's no longer designed, it's no longer built, there's no longer protocol, it's just a list of rules enforced. And Romanism didn't merely change the commandment, it changed in the minds of men the very nature of the law itself. And so what are the consequences? Let me walk you through the consequences of what happened to Christianity because Christianity accepted God's law is an imperial Roman type law, not the designer law. God is no longer seen as creator and designer but as dictator. God's law is not the basis upon which he created the life to operate. God's law is an imposed law to control behavior and test our obedience. Breaking God's imposed law requires imposed death penalty. God, in order to be just, must impose death. God, not sin, is the source of suffering and death. God must be appeased or propitiated to avoid his anger, wrath, and inflicted punishment. Jesus died to pay our legal penalty to an offended God. Jesus killed God, excuse me, God killed Jesus on the cross. The cross becomes perverted to promote Satan's view of God. Trust in God is undermined. Now let me walk you through and contrast these things for you. Two types of law, natural law of love versus imposed imperial Roman law. Violations of God's natural law are incompatible with life, as I've given you examples, multiple examples from nature. You deviate from this, you cannot continue to live. Violations of imposed law, however, are not incompatible with life. Deviations from the, from the natural law require the designer, God, to heal, fix, restore, lest death ensue. That's why John 3, 16 and 17, God sold the world, he sent his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's what he's doing, he's healing, he's saving. But under the imposed law, violations require the ruling authority to kill, to impose death, lest unpunished rebellion ensue. Christ's mission under the natural law is to destroy sinfulness, destroy Satan, and to restore mankind. Christ's mission under the imposed law is to pay legal penalties to God, appease God, and propitiate his wrath. The problem under the natural law is actual sin in man. We're defective. We're no longer in harmony. We're, we're broken. We have a carnal nature. We're out of harmony with the way God built life. We've got a problem in us. The problem under the imposed law is anger in God. This is the true view of God under the natural view, the law of love. This is the pagan view of God under the imposed law. Jesus and God, two ways to govern. John 13, all power is given to Jesus, it says, and what did he do? He got up and he washed a dozen pair of dirty feet. He heals the sick, he feeds the hungry, he serves. The ruler gives freely to support those he rules. Imperial Rome, power over to control others, imposes laws, imposes penalties, demands service. We are taxed and taken from to support the state. Jesus wins hearts with love and truth. Imperial Rome, this type of law construct demands obedience by fear of punishment. Jesus, God, leaves us free to make up our own mind. Imperial Rome coerces. God is open and truthful. Imperial Rome, secretive and, and, and deceives. Natural law, think about how it worked, how Jesus practiced this. On the Sabbath, what did he do? He spent his time healing others. But those who hold an imperial Roman imposed law construct rules that have to be keep, kept, you can't do that, you've gotta keep the rules. The rules say you must not do this on the Sabbath. How dare you? We need to stone you for trying to heal people on Sabbath. Or the woman caught in adultery, thrown down before Christ, what does he do? He forgives her. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and live a better life. Have a new heart. Be changed. Don't, don't go down those destructive paths anymore. Under the imperial rule, she's caught in adultery, and we know that the punishment for that is stoning. We need to stone her. She must be punished. Sin must be punished. Those who disagree under the natural model, we leave free. Those who disagree under the imposed model, we torture and kill and imprison. Remember the dark ages? Love your enemies. Give your life for your enemies. According to the, the natural law, loving others more than self, under the imposed law model, though, we kill our enemies. Remember the Crusades, what the church was doing during this time. Notice the contrast. 
from what Christ did and how the early church did to what happened after Constantine converted and the, and the idea of God's law got changed from the law of love to this imperial list of rules. Sacrifice self for others under the natural law. Demand others serve and obey us under the imperial law. Tr- turn the other cheek under the law of love. Violence against our own families under this law. And let me show you the data on that. This is gonna shock you. This has been peer-reviewed and published in peer-reviewed journals. This is very validated data. In the uh, first two columns are percentage of women. The far far two columns are percentage of men. The blue represents Christian homes, and the brown represents the general population from which they're compared. And the first column is total any report of at least one of the following types of violence against your, your spouse. And in the uh, percentage of Christian women experienced 33.8%, one third of Christian women had some violence against them from their spouse. In the general community, 22 to 37%. So those are basically the same. The men, 20% of men in Christian homes experienced some type of violence against them from their wives. And in the general population, it's seven to to 18%. Um, And then if you look down at this one, pushed, grabbed, shoved you. 28% of women in Christian homes, 18% in non-Christian homes. 17% of men in Christian homes, 5% in non-Christian homes. Beat you up, 8.8% of women in Christian homes and 8.5% in non-Christian homes. Uh, Men, 2.4% in Christian homes, 0.6% 0.6% in non-Christian homes. Threatened to use a weapon on you. 7.1% of the women in Christian homes, 28 to 6.3% of women in, in the general community. And 5.1% of men versus 0.4 to 2% of men in, in the general community. So 5.1% in the Christian homes. And then um, actually used a weapon on you, a knife or a gun. 2% of the women in the Christian homes, 0.7 to 2 uh, 0.6% in the, non, uh, in the general community, and 2.2% of, of Christian men had the wife use a weapon on them compared to 0.1 to 0.9% in the general community. So what does all this data mean? And, and, and I'm, hopefully you all are, are getting, being uh, sobered by this data. But it means that if you're a woman, the likelihood of you being abused in a Christian home is no different than in a non-Christian home. And if you're a man, the likelihood of being abused is two to four times higher in a Christian home than a non-Christian home. Think about this. This is, this is quite sad, isn't it? Shouldn't people who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, who are to love others more than self, who are to give their lives, shouldn't they love their families enough they stop abusing them and abuse them less than the people who don't profess Jesus Christ? Well, what's going on here? The data does not support that. How can this be? How can this be? By beholding, we are changed. We actually become like the God we worship. Worship a God of love and become more loving, but worship an authoritarian dictator and you become more abusive. This is a a neurobiological phenomenon known as neuroplasticity. The brain actually structurally changes depending on how you use your brain. Which neural circuits you fire will grow stronger. Neural circuits which you are not using will be pruned and deleted. This is uh, the ability of the brain, it's called neuroplasticity, the ability to rewire, grow new neurons, establish new pathways and delete unused ones, neuroplasticity. The brain is in a constant state of flux, remodeling based on the activity upon which you engage. Now, I'm gonna teach you one of the mechanisms, there's multiple mechanisms working in concert, but here's one of the mechanisms this happens. It's called BDNF, brain for the B, derived neurotrophic factor. It means that the brain makes it, brain derived, neurotrophic is a, is a word that means it makes neurons grow strong. So this is the factor that makes neurons grow strong. Think of it as fertilizer for your neurons. When a neuron has this factor there, it will sprout new connections, it will grow new, new neurons, neurons will be produced under the influence of proteins like this. But this particular protein doesn't come off the DNA as BDNF. What the DNA actually produces is a precursor protein called pro-BDNF. And pro-BDNF, if it binds to a neuron or an axon or a dendrite, it will kill it. So think of it as weed killer for the neuron. So what's actually produced is the weed killer, and what is needed is an enzyme that will cleave the pro-BDNF into BDNF for the neural circuit to grow stronger. And what determines whether the neuron or neural circuit has the enzyme which will cleave the weed killer into the fertilizer so your neural circuit goes stronger, what determines whether that enzyme is there is the 
activity of the neural circuit itself. If the neural circuit is firing and exercise and being used, it will produce this enzyme, which will cleave pro-BDNF, the weed killer, into BDNF, the fertilizer, and the neural circuit expands and grows stronger. If the neural circuit is not being used, the enzyme isn't produced, the weed killer comes along and starts pruning the circuitry back. So, let me give you an example. When you were in high school, maybe you took a foreign language class. In the beginning, you were just brute force memorizing words, and as you're memorizing those words, you're causing new synaptic connections to form. And if you keep practicing those words, then what'll happen is the enzyme is formed. It will cleave pro-BDNF into BDNF. That will cause new connections to grow. And as you keep practicing, that circuitry will continue to expand. And over the course of a couple of years of taking foreign language, you not only increase your vocabulary, pretty soon you're able to form sentences. Your, your, your enunciation improves as the circuitry becomes more complex and then you graduate <laughs> and 20 years go by and you haven't practiced that language and your church is having a mission trip to a country that speaks that language and your spouse goes oh my spouse uh, took, took two years of that and I, shh, shh. <laughs> what's going on with that what happened to your ability over those 20 years if you don't use it you will Lose it. Pro BDNF is going to come out and it's going to prune that neural circuit. This is awesome, guys, what I'm teaching you. It's incredible how God designed this. Do you understand what I just taught you is how bad habits can be overcome? How unhealthy belief systems can be gotten rid of? How old, painful memories can be lost? Sadly, some of the good ones can be lost too. <laughs> but, but, but if we don't use the circuit, the circuit will be actually structurally changed. But if we use it repetitively, it continues to grow stronger. And now, what, the, the next point of this, imagination and neural activity. They took people and put them in, in functional scanners where they could look at their brain and see which neural circuits were firing. They had put a, put a keyboard there and had a person play a piece of music while the uh, scanner was firing. And then they took the keyboard away. They documented how that neural circuit pattern looks when they play this piece of music. And then they had them play the piece of music in their imagination. They put little EMG wires in their muscles so they could actually be sure there's no muscle contraction going on so we're not actually causing the muscles to move in the arm. And guess what? Same neural circuits fired in the brain when they played the piece of music in their imagination. Now get the significance of this. We can take pedophiles and we can lock them in prison where they cannot behaviorally act on the dysfunctional behavior. Can we control what they imagine when they're in prison? And if they spend 20 years in prison imagining their deviant behavior, they will come out a more recidivist pedophile than they went in. The only way to break these neural circuits is, as the Bible says, we must bring every thought into captivity to Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus knew when he said, you say if you commit adultery, you commit sin. I say if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. See, it's actually deeper than the behavior. It's what's going on in the mind and the heart. And so when we actually stop firing the unhealthy circuits, they will be pruned. We fire the healthy circuits, they will grow stronger. Every thought must be brought into captivity. So the brain will change structurally. It will actually rewire, but only if we change the circuits we are firing. If we have theologies that chronically fire fear circuits, they will grow stronger, resulting in greater inflammatory cascades with greater risks of mental health problems, depression, dementia, relationship conflicts, abuse to our families, physical health problems. But if we teach God's law of love and his character of love and grow those anterior cingulate cortex circuits, they will calm the amygdala of the fear circuits, resulting in reduction of those inflammatory cascades, healthier brains, healthier bodies, healthier relationships. Even when we reach the lost, how you present God's law makes a difference. Uh, you, let's use the example of an her IV heroin user who's been using dirty needles and now he has an infection in his heart from IV heroin use. He has been breaking the laws of health, natural laws have been broken, he has been breaking the imposed laws of the land, he's a breaking both types of laws, right? You all with me? Does he want to go before the magistrate? and have his misdeeds revealed, and have the judge pronounce judgment and then sentencing upon him. Does he want to do that? But does he want to go to the doctor and have the deeds revealed and the history of all he's gone through and have the doctor examine and find all the defects and infection and, and bacteria growing in the valves of his heart? Does he want the doctor to find everything that's wrong, pronounce judgment known as a diagnosis, and sentence known as a therapeutic treatment? Does he want to have that happen? When we present God as the judge, we obstruct sinners from coming to him. 
When we present God as the great designer, the creator, the builder, the restorer, the healer, the savior, we open the hearts of men and they'll come to him. So what is biblical justice then? Psalms 82.3, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Isaiah 1, 16 and 17, wash yourselves clean, stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed, give orphans their rights and defend widows. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. The Lord is a God of justice, Isaiah 30, 18. This is what the Lord says to the dynasty of David. Give justice each morning to the people you judge. Help those who have been robbed. Rescue them from their oppressors, Jeremiah 21, 12. What is biblical justice? Delivering the oppressed, not punishing the oppressor. Why? Because God's law is the design protocol for life and deviations are destructive to the breaker of the law. There is no need to punish someone who ties a plastic bag over their head. There's no need to punish those who deviate from God's design. They sear their conscience, they warp their characters, they destroy their own souls. Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. They think they're killing me. What they're actually doing is they're cutting themselves off from the only avenue of salvation and healing. So I want you to think about this. What would you do? You walk in on somebody who has just hung themselves, suicide attempt, just hung themselves. As you walk through the door, the chair is kicked out and they're dangling by their neck from a throat, from, from, from a rope. They're breaking the law of respiration. What would justice require you to do? They're a lawbreaker. What is the right what, is, what do you do if you do what is right, what is just, then what do you do? They're breaking the law, what do you do? Do you beat them for, and punish them for breaking the law? Do you have a trial, present evidence and pronounce judicial findings? Do you seek to deliver and save? If you're gonna be just, if you're gonna do what's right, don't you immediately run over and pick them up and try to save them from, from this breach in the law. This is God's justice. He's constantly working to save us from the breach in the law. Dr. Ben Carson, in his book, America the Beautiful, describing the justice system implemented through Moses in the Old Testament. Uh, they focused on reparation to the victim rather than punishment or fines levied on the perpetrator. Newtown, Connecticut shooting. You all know the tragic shooting. What kind of justice do you think those parents of those murdered children would prefer? punishing the shooter or resurrecting and restoring their children. That's God's justice. He is going to restore his universe. He is going to, to heal all the damage. Anything that's been taken, he's gonna give it back to those who allow him. He's gonna rebuild his universe back in harmony with himself. He's gonna set things right again. The Bible says what, that sin is the source and cause of death. The wages of sin is death. For sin pays its own wage, it's death. Sin, when it's full grown, according to James, brings forth death. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. Why? Because that nature is deviant from God's design and life is incompatible, deviant to God's design. Sin transgresses the protocols upon which life is built. So sin deviates from God's design and thus the sinner, the sin destroys the sinner. This is out of uh, the Hard Sayings of the Bible, published by InterVarsity Press, 1996, and it says, in rejecting God's structure and establishing our own, in, violation, in violating God's intention for the creation and substituting our own intention, we cause our own disintegration. And here's a quote from a, a historical Seventh-day Adventist perspective, uh, published in a book called Selected Messages, page 235. We are not to regard God as waiting to punish the sinner for a sin. The sinner brings the punishment upon himself. His own actions start a train of circumstance that brings the sure result. Every act of transgression reacts upon the sinner, works in him a change of character, and makes it more easy for him to transgress again. By choosing to sin, men separate themselves from God, cut themselves off from the channel of blessing, and the sure result is ruin and death. 
You see, both of those quotations are describing natural law, deviating from the way God built things that we freely can do that take us out of harmony with our creator, designer, and source of life and ultimately result in ruin and death. These passages are, are describing the designer, not the dictator. So why hasn't Christ returned? Am I the only one who longs for Christ to return or do you long for Christ's return? Amen, absolutely. Why hasn't he returned? Well, Christ said, when the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, then the end will come. What kingdom? The kingdom of love. Now let me ask you, have we taken, has the gospel of the kingdom of love gone to the world or instead has Christianity taken an imperial Roman God who imposes laws, punishes lawbreakers, and requires appeasement to the world? Well, I don't wanna just ask you that, I wanna show you evidence. But before I show you the evidence, I have to give you some caveats about the evidence. When a doctor diagnoses a problem and reveals it to the patient, sometimes the patient feels uncomfortable, feels condemned, feels embarrassed, feels put down. But the doctor is not condemning, the doctor is not trying to embarrass, the doctor is diagnosing with a heart to heal, the doctor is not against the patient but for the patient. We cannot solve a problem until we first identify it and admit we have it. The evidence I present here is not to condemn anyone or any group or make anyone uncomfortable, but to expose an infection in Christianity in order to bring about healing and high hope the second coming. The following evidence is not intended to present an official position of any denomination, but demonstrate regardless of official position or denomination, there's an infection commonly, common and deeply rooted across denominational boundaries within Christianity as a whole. And they'll start, this is a Catholic perspective from the president of the Catholic Apologetics. And it's evidence that the imperial Roman law has infected Christianity. What did Christ's suffering and death actually accomplish that allowed the Father to provide the human race with salvation? Scripture teaches only that Christ became a propitiation, a sin offering, or a sacrifice for sins. Essentially, this means that Christ, because he was guiltless, sin-free, and in favor with God, could offer himself as a means of persuading God to relent of his angry wrath against the sins of mankind. Anger against sin shows the personal side of God, for sin is a personal offense against him. God is personally offended by sin and thus he needs to be personally appeased in order to offer a personal forgiveness. In keeping with his divine principles, his personal nature, and the magnitude of the sins of man, the only thing that God would allow to appease him was the suffering and death of the sinless representative of mankind, namely Christ. This is out of a call to evangelical unity published in Christianity Today. This is a consortium of multiple theologians from different denominational backgrounds. We affirm that the atonement of Christ by which in obedience he offered a perfect sacrifice propitiating the Father by paying for our sins and satisfying divine justice on our behalf according to God's eternal plan is an essential element of the gospel. Notice the focus here is Christ is doing something to change or deal with God's attitude or God's issues. The word propitiation, this is out of uh, foundations of Pentecostal theology. The word propitiation properly signifies the turning away of wrath by a sacrifice. Thus it signifies appeasement. According to Leon Morris, the consistent biblical view is that the sin of man has incurred the wrath of God. That wrath is averted only by Christ's atoning offering. From this standpoint, his saving work is properly called propitiation. Again, turning away God and God's attitude. This is, um, was published in August 2013. Um, this is the wrath of God satisfied substitutionary atonement and conservative resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention. And this is what it says in the article. All the understandings of the cross in the Bible are themselves dependent upon penal substitution. In other words, Jesus was punished by his father in our place. Um, J Jesus Christ took upon himself, this is... Um, um, let's see, surveying the one, atonement, uh, the surveying the wondrous cross, the atonement in the church history, reformation. It's an online magazine of confessing evangelicals. Jesus Christ took upon himself the punishment that the sins of the people deserved. In other words, the reformers, their understanding of the reformers, understood that the atonement was satisfaction by means of punishment. God was satisfied because he was able to punish Jesus in our place. Um, this is uh, George Knight, The Cross of Christ, published by Review. Notice the first two sentences, they're quite right. Paul always speaks of people being reconciled to God. He never refers to God being reconciled to us. Quite true. How much leeway is there in always and never? 
Notice the next words. In spite of that fact. Okay, this is, what, this is what the Bible always says, but in spite of that, we actually know better than the Bible. In spite of that fact, however, we should recognize the sin affects both sides. Humanity's rebellion and sense of guilt alienated it from God, while God was separated from humanity by his necessary hatred of and judgment on sin, his wrath. Christ's sacrificial death, propitiation, removed the barrier of reconciliation from God's side. Um, this is the uh, same book. Uh, Leon Morris writes that if God's wrath was regarded as a very real factor so that the sin, sinner is exposed to its severity, then the removal of the wrath will be an important part of understanding salvation. Uh, it, does not, uh, it does not fade away at being given some other name. In other words, God's wrath must be propitiated or turned away from the sinner. That was one of the aims of Christ's self-sacrifice on the cross. This is from the book 27 Fundamental Beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, Christ's self-sacrifice is pleasing to God because this self-sacrifice, this sacrificial offering, took away the barrier between God and sinful man in that Christ fully bore God's wrath on man's sin. What is the barrier between God and man according to this reference? God's wrath is a barrier. What happened to what John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Huh. It's not our sin that keeps us from God now anymore. It's wrath in God that is actually a barrier that has to be removed. This is from the um, Signs of the Times, uh, September 24, 1902, an historic uh, perspective of what the Adventist Church used to teach. To break down the barrier that Satan had erected between God and man, Christ made a full and complete sacrifice revealing unexampled self-denial. He revealed to the world an amazing spectacle of God living in human flesh and sacrificing himself to save fallen men. What wonderful love. You see a grand difference between those two views. Uh, Seventh-day Adventist 27 belief. Again, page 111. For a loving God to maintain his justice and righteousness, the atoning death of Christ became a moral and legal necessity. God's justice requires that sin be carried to judgment. God must therefore execute judgment on sin and thus the sinner. In this execution, the Son of God took our place, the sinner's place, according to God's will. Do you hear what that's saying? It's saying, that, it's saying that God executed Christ on the cross in our place. Well, here's the, um, from something called Ministry Magazine 2007. Why did God the Father choose a cross to be the instrument of death? Why did he not choose to have Christ instantly beheaded or quickly run through with a spear or a sword? Why was God unjust in executing judgment on Christ with a cross when he could have done it by beheading a noose, a sword, a gas chamber, a bolt of lightning, or a lethal injection? Or this is Adventist Review um, 2007. One of the fundamental problems of moral influence theory is that it rejects the substitutionary nature of Christ's death, the idea that God had to kill the innocent instead of the guilty in order to save us is considered a violation of justice. In this view, who is the source of death and killing? So let me ask you, uh, so the designer is now presented as dictator. What does inspiration actually say? Surely who took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. Bible prophesied through Isaiah thousands years ago that Christ would come take up our sick condition, our infirmities, carry our, our sorrows, yet we would misunderstand and think God was doing this to him. Jesus speaking to those who would later crucify him said, you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Who did Jesus say is, is, say is the source of death? And then here's a historic Adventist perspective out of a book called Desire of Ages, page 761. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of heavenly beings. Who do you believe killed Christ at the cross, God or Satan? Satan, no question about it. And so we live in a war zone in which your view of God is being challenged. Christianity has been infected with this idea of an imperial Roman law construct which results in this idea that God, in order to be just, must use his power to kill, and Christ came to be killed by his father at the cross. We must reject those ideas and come back to the truth. Many voices have risen to oppose the dictator view of God. Let me show you some voices that have opposed it. Augustine. 
Does this mean that the son was already so reconciled to us that he was even prepared to die for us, while the father was still so angry with us that unless the son died for us that he would not be reconciled to us? The father loved us not merely before the son died for us, but before he founded the world. This is a 19th century Congregationalist theologian, uh, George MacDonald. The Lord never came to deliver men from the consequences of their sin while those sins yet remain, yet feeling nothing of the dread hatefulness of their sin, Men have constantly taken this word that the Lord came to deliver us from our sins to mean that he came to save us from the punishment of their sins. This idea has terribly corrupted the preaching of the gospel. The message of the good news has not been truly communicated. Unable to believe in the forgiveness of the Father in heaven, imagining him, not at liberty to forgive or incapable of forgiving forthright, not really believing him God who is fully our, our savior, but a God bound either by his own nature or by the law above him or compulsory upon him to exact some recompense or satisfaction for sin. A multitude of religious teachers have taught their fellow men that Jesus came to bear our punishment and save us from hell. But in, the, in that, they have misrepresented his true mission. Or from... 1897 General Conference Session, SDA theologian George Fifield. We said, God is doing all this. God is killing him, punishing him to satisfy his wrath in order to let us off. That is a pagan conception of sacrifice. The Christian idea of sacrifice is this, and let us notice the contrast. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the Christian idea. Yes, sir, indifference keeps, hatred keeps, selfishness keeps, but love and love only sacrifices, gives freely, gives itself, gives without counting the cost, gives because it is love. That is sacrifice, whether it is sacrifice of bulls or goats or of him who is the Lamb of God. It is the sacrifice that is revealed throughout the entire Bible. But the pagan idea of sacrifice is just the opposite. It is that some God is always offended, always angry, and his wrath must be propitiated in some way. This is Oswald Chambers. The Bible does not say that God punished the human race for one man's sin, but that the nature of sin, namely my claim to my right to myself, entered into the human race through one man. But it also says that another man took upon himself the sin of the human race and put it away. An infinitely more profound revelation. Sin is something I am born with and cannot touch. Only God touches sin through redemption. It is through the cross of Christ that God redeemed the entire human race from the possibility of damnation through the heredity of sin. God nowhere holds a person responsible for having their heredity of sin and does not condemn anyone because of it. Condemnation comes when I realize that Jesus came to deliver me from this heredity of sin and yet I refuse to let him do so. From that moment I begin to get the seal of damnation. This is the condemnation in the critical moment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Let me explain this, give me a little analogy. Imagine an HIV infected man and an HIV infected woman get together and have a baby born HIV infected. What did the baby do wrong? Nothing. But does the baby still have a condition which if unremedied will kill it? Absolutely. That, since Adam and Eve sinned, we are born in sin, conceived in iniquity. We're born in a condition that's not our fault and we don't have to feel guilty for having the condition any more than the child born HIV infected needs to feel guilty for having the condition. But if as that child grows up, there is a free remedy that is offered that will cure the child and the child refuses the remedy, will that be the child's fault? That's our situation. This is what Oswald Chambers is saying. God has provided remedy. He doesn't hold us responsible for the condition with which we were born, but he's provided remedy to cure us. The devil does not want you to take that remedy, so he offers a false remedy, a legal fiction that gives you this idea of false security that some payment is made and some record books are adjusted, but your heart continues to be corroded with sin. Baptist theologian Humphreys Fisher, in his 1978 book, The Death of Christ, Humphreys conceded that there could be a healthy understanding of substitution, but he emphatically denied that the father punished the son for our sins. In his words, men punished him for alleged crimes, probably blasphemy and revolution, but God who knew he was righteous did not disapprove of him at all. He approved of him. To put it another way, Jesus experienced the pain which a man might feel if he were being punished by God for great sins, but he was not punished by God. This is absolutely right. Charismatic theologian Derek Flood. We think that the gospel is rooted in the idea that Jesus had to die to fulfill the demands of punitive justice. This is an understanding of the atonement known as penal substitution. Penal meaning punish and substitution meaning that Jesus is punished instead of us. What I propose is that the above is not at all what the Bible teaches. And instead, 
is a result of people projecting their worldly understanding of punitive justice, worldly understanding, their idea of imposed law is projected in, onto the Bible text. The New Testament, in contrast, is actually a critique of punitive justice. It presents it as a problem to be solved, not as a means of solution. The problem of wrath, that is punitive justice, is overcome through the cross, which is an act of restoration, restoring humanity to a right relationship with God. In other words, restorative justice is how God in Christ acts to heal the problem of punitive justice. Love is not in conflict with justice. Love is how justice comes about because the New Testament understanding of justice is ultimately not about punishment, but about making things right again. Evangelical, Philip Yancey. Because of Jesus, I must adjust my instinctive notions about God. Perhaps that lay at the heart of his mission. Jesus reveals a God who comes in search of us, a God who makes room for our freedom even when it costs the life of his son, a God who is vulnerable. Above all, Jesus reveals a God who is love. Anglican scholar J.B. Phillips. Jesus once declared that God is good to the ungrateful and the wicked, Luke 6.35. And I remember preaching a sermon on this text to a horrified and even astonished congregation who simply refused to believe in this astonishing liberality of God. That God should be in a state of constant fury with the wicked seemed to them only right and proper. But that God should be kind toward those who were defying or disobeying his laws seemed to them a monstrous injustice. Yet I was but quoting the Son of God himself, and I only comment here that the terrifying risks that God takes are part of his nature. We do not need to explain or modify his unremitting love toward mankind. And then last of the quotes, this is from L, uh, SDA founder Ellen G. White. While God had desired to teach men that from his own love comes the gift which reconciles them to himself, the arch enemy of mankind has endeavored to represent God as one who delights in their destruction. Thus the sacrifices and ordinances designed of heaven to reveal divine love have been perverted to serve as means whereby sinners have vainly hoped to propitiate with gifts and good works the wrath of an offended God. How do you see God and his law? As designer or dictator? In Revelation, a prophecy for our time in human history, it calls us back to prepare for Christ's return. It calls us with these words, to worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of living water. This is a call to worship the designer, the creator, the builder. We are called to reject the dictator views of God. And we can only do that when we come back to understanding God's law as the law of love and expression of his character, how he built his universe to run. Because we have power over what we believe, but what we believe holds power over us. Impose law concepts, incite fear, damage brain, body, and relationships, but perfect love casts out all fear, brings healing to brain, body, and relationships. Why do I present this material? Why do I do it? Two reasons, I want people to be free. I have had so many patients come see me who have been burdened under terrible false guilt, terrible fear, terrible insecurity, going to church their whole life but never finding peace because they live under an imperial Roman God construct uh, that if they just mess up, if they forget to confess one sin, uh, this type, I remember one person said to me one time, this guy, true story, had, had a heart attack. His heart stopped three times and he remembered in the ER they were shocking his heart and each time that his heart stopped he went out and each time they shocked him he came back and he was aware and he said he had one thought on his mind. I hope there isn't one sin I've forgotten to confess that will keep me out of heaven. Think about it. Imperial, people live in fear, fear of God, not love for him. And I wanna see Christ return. 20 years ago this, this New Year's Eve my father died. And if any of you and all of you who have, have lost a loved one, you know the heartache and pain of that. And it made me realize very clearly as nothing else had ever done in my life to that point, that there is nothing in this world worth holding on to except the people you love. There's nothing. And if we would do our job and take the gospel to the world, the Lord would come and we could be with our loved ones again. Conclusion for this talk, God is love. God's law is an expression of his character of love and the protocols upon which life is built. Humanity is deviant from God's design in an eternal condition. 
humanity, and I want to be, make, say this very clear because if I don't, somebody will go out here and, and accuse me of something I don't believe. Humanity could not be saved without the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe in substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, but not to appease an angry and wrathful father. Christ is our substitute in that he took our terminal condition upon himself and cured it, and now offers a, to reproduce in us his victory, such that it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. I invite you to worship the designer and reject the dictator view of God. Thank you.